If you walked into the Appalachian backcountry around 1847, you would have heard neighbors laughing about one man's strange winter project. They said he was wasting time, wasting tools, and wasting what little energy a frontier family had, while everyone else cut firewood, split rails, and patched cabins before the frost came. He spent weeks carving a hollow tunnel through a fallen chestnut log. People joked that he was trying to heat a house with a wooden chimney running backwards. But when winter finally struck the Blue Ridge, that same crazy idea kept his family 30 degrees warmer than any cabin for miles. Today, we are exploring the documented historical account of E.M. McAllister, a mid-19th century settler whose hollow-log heating duct became one of the most unusual, clever, and efficient heating solutions in Appalachian history. This is not legend and not folklore. His method was recorded in the WPA Federal Writers Project interviews in the 1930s, when surviving children and grandchildren of mountain pioneers described how frontier ingenuity kept homes alive through brutal winters. Among those testimonies, the McAllister system stands out for its boldness. It is one of the clearest examples of how a single, unorthodox piece of engineering changed life in a remote homestead. Before we dive deeper, make sure you subscribe to this channel if you want more real, fully historical survival engineering stories that show how ordinary pioneers solved extraordinary problems. Your support helps bring these forgotten innovations back into public memory. To understand why McAllister's hollow log tunnel was mocked, you need to understand the climate and culture of the southern Appalachian frontier. The Blue Ridge was unforgiving in the 1800s. Winters were not constant blizzards, but harsh cold snaps were intense enough to kill livestock, freeze wells, and collapse poorly built chimneys. Firewood was plentiful in theory, the forest seemed endless but cutting and splitting it with 19th century tools, while also farming, hauling water, tending animals, and protecting the homestead, meant firewood was always in short supply. Every stick had value. Every wasted cord meant hunger or sickness. Most pioneer cabins relied on one source of heat, a huge stone or clay fireplace that could consume half a day's wood supply. These fireplaces were notoriously inefficient. They generated intense heat but radiated little warmth across the room. Much of the heat shot straight up the chimney and vanished into the mountain wind. By midnight, the cabin temperatures sank again. But McAllister known in the WPA transcript only by the initial E and the surname spoken by his descendants refused to accept the waste. He had come from a long line of Scots-Irish settlers known for their stubbornness, thrift, and mechanical intuition. According to the interview, he spent several evenings sitting outside watching the way smoke curled around fallen logs and the way warm air gathered beneath the bark of dead chestnut trunks. In the frontier world, observations like these were not hobbies, they were survival lessons. Then he made his decision. Instead of burning all his wood at the cabin hearth, he would conduct heat from a small, controlled outdoor fire into the cabin using a hollowed log, buried partly underground. This would channel warm air directly under the floorboards and up through a vent beside the sleeping platform. Neighbors dismissed the idea immediately. A log used as a heat tunnel sounded to them like a contradiction. Wood burns, fire burns, wood. Why build a heating system from the very thing that flames consume? They said it would either smolder slowly until it collapsed, or it would ignite and burn the whole cabin down. What they did not understand was that McAllister was not running flame through the log, he was running warm air and smoke-free heat, the same principle used in ancient hypercost systems. The fallen chestnut he selected was massive, dense, and resistant to rot. He stripped its bark, bored through it with a hand auger and chisel, then lined the inner surface with a mixture of clay, ash, and creek sand to create a fire-resistant sleeve. This produced a long sealed duct that could deliver steady heat without open flame. By late autumn the system was ready. Neighbors shook their heads. Some even joked that McAllister would be back to chopping wood like a normal man the moment snow hit. They could not have been more wrong. When the first cold front swept across the Appalachian Plateau in early December, families in the hollows and ridges began their usual winter routine reinforcing door gaps with rags, stacking emergency firewood inside, and lighting massive evening fires that filled the cabins with uneven heat. Some homes overheated near the hearth while the sleeping corners remained freezing. Others struggled to maintain a fire at night, risking frostbite by morning. But the McAllister cabin operated differently that year. If you walked behind it, you would have seen a small fire pit built several yards away unusual for a pioneer home. Above it, a short stone who'd channeled heat into the open mouth of the hollow log duct. This pit burned slow, steady, and hot using small pieces of wood rather than large logs. Because the fire pit was outside, smoke never entered the home. From there, warm air traveled through the clay-lined log tunnel, gradually cooling but still delivering a consistent stream of heat beneath the cabin floor. The log's position partially buried loud the surrounding soil to regulate temperature, preventing dramatic heat loss. Soil is an excellent thermal mass. It stores heat and releases it slowly. Mick. Alistair exploited this natural advantage without any formal engineering education. Inside the cabin, a vent made from a flat stone plate and a hand-forged iron grate allowed the warm air to rise gently. It did not create a roaring blast of heat like a modern furnace. 
Instead, it raised the interior temperature by 20 to 30 degrees Fahrenheit over outdoor conditions. According to the WPA account, that was the difference between bitter cold and survivable comfort. The efficiency surprised even McAllister's skeptical relatives because the small fire pit burned only what it needed to maintain gentle airflow. It consumed dramatically less fuel than a typical cabin hearth. Neighbors were spending hours chopping and splitting wood each week while Michaelister's woodpile barely shrank. The WPA record noted the phrase, he kept warm on half the wood of any man on the ridge. The duct also had unexpected benefits. With the main fire outside, there was no risk of chimney sparks igniting the roof, a common cause of winter cabin fires in the 1800s. Indoor smoke known to cause chronic respiratory problems was almost non-existent in the McAllister home during the cold months. The children slept more comfortably. The drying racks suspended from the rafters cured meat faster because airflow was warmer and steadier. These small improvements mattered in remote mountain life. Word began to spread across the ridge and down the valley. Once dismissive neighbors visited out of curiosity, some expected to find the log charred through others thought the system was pure superstition. Instead, they found a warm, dry, well-ventilated cabin that felt radically different from the smoky, unevenly heated interiors they were used to. The most defining moment of validation came during a late-season cold snap. Temperatures dropped rapidly one night, freezing streams and killing early plant shoots. Many families woke to frigid rooms. The McAllister cabin, however, remained warm enough that water did not freeze inside clay jugs near the wall. The hollow tunnel, still carrying heat from its sheltered fire pit, maintained a stable interior climate. According to testimony, several neighbors sought help from McAllister that night. Dot suddenly, the man they mocked became the person they depended on. He lent firewood to a widowed neighbor whose own woodpile had frozen. He helped two families start their hearth fires. Again after their chimneys clogged with ice, some eventually built their own versions of the heating duct simplified, unlined, or shorter but none worked as effectively as the original, carefully crafted prototype. What made McAllister's method extraordinary was not just the engineering, but the mindset behind it. Frontier life rewarded conformity most families survived by repeating the proven methods of their parents. Departures from tradition often invited ridicule. Yet McAllister's willingness to innovate, rooted in both necessity and observation, transformed his home into one of the warmest in the region. After the winter that proved the hollow tunnel's effectiveness, McAllister's method gradually earned acceptance, though it never became widespread. Appalachian frontiersmen respected ingenuity, yet few had the time, tools, or patience to duplicate such a project exactly. The system required a perfectly sized fallen tree, extensive hollowing work, and careful clay lining, it was not a simple weekend task it was a month-long endeavor driven by determination, not convenience. Still, for decades the McAllister cabin retained a quiet reputation in the region. His descendants lived in the same structure until the early 20th century. By the time WPA researchers arrived in the 1930s to collect oral histories the log duct was no longer intact but the story of the system was clearly remembered and the remains of the old clay-lined log collapsed and partially decayed were pointed out by elderly descendants and neighbors. The WPA records, which preserved countless details of rural life, became the written proof that this unconventional heating method existed and had been tested under real frontier conditions. Why does this small piece of history matter today? because it highlights a fundamental truth about frontier engineering. Necessity produces ideas that textbooks never teach. The Appalachian pioneers were not trained architects, engineers, or scientists, yet their observations of wood, soil, airflow, and heat allowed them to create solutions tailored perfectly to their environment. The hollow tunnel was, in essence, a thermal conduction system that borrowed principles seen in ancient Roman hypercosts, Inuit snow hut ventilation, and Scandinavian sod home heating channels. McAllister likely had no knowledge of those traditions. What he possessed was a willingness to trust his own experimentation. Today, modern off-grid builders and homesteaders study systems like this because they illustrate how low-technology solutions can outperform high-energy ones in certain scenarios. An insulated earth channel carrying warm air across a distance is a concept modern engineers use in passive solar homes, underground heating ducts, and even eco-designed greenhouses. McAllister's buried log duct was a frontier expression of a timeless engineering truth. Stability comes from controlling airflow, not just generating more heat. His system also reveals something about the Appalachian mindset of the 1800s. Despite living in isolation, families learned from the land and from each other. When a new idea worked, no matter how strange it first appeared, it slowly entered the collective memory of the community. The laughter that greeted McAllister's hollow log transformed into respect, then curiosity, and eventually a minor local tradition. Even if few duplicated it perfectly, the principle of directing controlled heat into the living space spread through parts of the region. The historical value is also cultural. Too often, Frontier innovation is simplified into stereotypes of ruggedness or brute strength, but the true story of Appalachian survival is one of quiet, persistent intelligence people who solved problems with whatever materials the mountains gave them.
They understood that winter was a teacher, and cold was the examiner. Those who passed the test did so by thinking creatively. By the time electricity arrived in the hollows and ridges in the mid-20th century, such heating systems became obsolete. Fireplaces and later wood stoves remained common, but the clay-lined hollow log duct became a forgotten relic. Only the WPA documentation preserved it for future generations. Today, when we revisit this story, we are not just looking at an odd historical footnote. We are witnessing a genuine example of early American engineering built not in a workshop but in the forest, shaped not by formal training but by experience and necessity. McAllister's hollow log tunnel kept his family 30 degrees warmer, saved half the firewood of his neighbors, and protected the cabin from smoke and sparks. It proved that even in the most difficult environments, innovation thrives when someone is willing to see the world differently. If you want more authentic historical survival stories, more real frontier engineering, and more forgotten American ingenuity brought back to life, make sure to subscribe. This channel is dedicated to preserving the lessons left behind by people like McAllisterman and women who survived because they dared to innovate, when others only followed tradition. Their stories are worth remembering. And their ideas still have value today.